new Photic Realm announcement. Uh, submission windows for upcoming issues. Issue 10, the theme is justice. That's hard-boiled fiction with a supernatural twist. The deadline for that will be April 1st, 2020. Issue 11, the theme is kaiju. Giant monsters terrorizing civilization. Deadline will be October 1st, 2020 for those stories. Issue 12, the theme is lycanthropy, which is, of course, self-explanatory. Um, <laughs> it can be any type of animorph with a bloody twist. Uh, so I guess that's werewolves and Jesus, giant, I don't know. What do people turn into? Seals? I've just got a little seal on my desk, so I thought of that. I don't know. You have to be more imaginative than I just was. Uh, but the deadline for lycanthropy, January 1st, 2021. Good luck to everyone submitting. Mike Thorne is back, um, back to talk about his latest book, Shelter for the Damned, uh, out with Journal Stone. It's a great novel, first novel. I've been a fan of Mike's and I've talked to Mike ever since his first book came out. That was a collection of short stories, Darkest Hours, originally published by Unnerving, now being brought out again with Journal Stone. And he has another collection of short stories coming out later in the year as well, so it's a big year for Mike. Lots to talk about. Uh, we always have a good chat about uh, creativity and life and all the good stuff that we talk about here on Losing the Plot, so I hope you enjoy it. If you would like to be on the show or you want to tell me something about it, you can always do so using losingtheplotpodcast at gmail.com and I look forward to hearing from you. But that's on my intro chat, so here is my conversation with Mike Thorne. What's been going on? Mm, just teaching. Um starting to move ahead on the details for the darkest hours reissue which is fun yeah so we're talking about like cover design and stuff like that um that's a lot of fun and uh you know just living the pandemic dream waiting for that vaccine <laughs> um teaching my students about frankenstein uh yeah how about you um still working from home they threatened yeah, to let us go back in a few days but uh, then the AstraZeneca vaccine got rejected from here, so nobody can get that. So then I get to stay home again. It's fantastic. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I know so many people are itching to get back, and I'm like, as an extreme introvert, I'm dreading the small talk. You know, everyone's oh, saying, how, yeah. was your, how was your lockdown? And and I, I don't know. That's just I my also did nothing. Like, <laughs> yes. There's nothing to talk about. Yeah, exactly. Ever. <laughs> no, no, it's pandemic. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, oh, I dear. know. No, I know exactly what you mean. Um, I had like an evaluation with my managers every year and, and I was like, you know what, like I'm doing great at home. I said I would actually like to stay a few days, like um, even when the pandemic's over, because I'm getting so much work done. Like I don't yes. have to go suddenly so many things that I thought had to do with me being good at my job, like had nothing to do with it. Like waking up on time, getting the bus, like small talk, dressing uncomfortably, all the stuff that like, you take all this stuff away that has nothing to do with what I was hired to do. And I can do it so much more effectively. And I was like, that's cool. Can't I just do that? And they were like, well, Leo, I I, I am, I, I think we should challenge you like to, to, you know, get out there more, sit in an open plan office, talk to people about cars. I was like, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> no. I was oh. like, great, there's my next horror book. Yeah, all of that nightmare. i don't want to do any of that ever <laughs> no. oh my god oh boy talk about the weather sitting in an open plan office nah <laughs> nah man 
I don't think so. <laughs> I'll be honest though, like I will acknowledge, I think teaching is much more, I think teaching and learning is much more effective in a physical environment. Oh, I have yeah, to. For sure. For sure. It's yeah. just it's just true. I mean, I love working from home, but I do, I think my students um, are not getting the same optimal learning experience uh, mm -hmm. as they would if we were in the class, like engaging in discussion. No one's turning their webcams on. It's like pulling teeth, getting people to participate a lot of the time. Um, you know, a lot of them are probably on the call while they're at work or while shopping on Amazon or they're in bed, like who knows? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so that's, you know, I acknowledge that, but I think it should be an option, you know, for some students to Skype in or whatever. It's, it's good for accessibility and those sorts of things. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. And then all like, it, it's something we were all afraid of, but now we've learned we can do it, you know, and nobody can deny it anymore. Like I've been here doing my job for a full year at home. Like you can't tell me I can't do that. So yeah. I think we talked about this like in our very first chat as well, like how our writing responds not only to what's going on in writing, but also in TV and, and so on. Like what, I know films are a big medium for you, that feeds a lot into your writing. Is there like, what other kind of artistic sources are there? Do you go to art galleries or? Yeah, sometimes. Um, yeah, I think visual art to some extent influences me. The biggest influences would be um, fiction, philosophy and theory, um, and film and music to some extent too. Mm -hmm. Um, shelter for the damned was most heavily influenced, I'd say by philosophy and theory and poetry and fiction, but yeah, film too, actually. So yeah, you kind of pull from everywhere or conversations with friends or memories, relationships. Um, I've actually, I have actually been influenced by dreams. I know some people say they've never got anything like concrete from dreams, but I've had some hyper vivid dreams that have given me imagery and tone and things like that. So yeah, it comes from everywhere. Mm. So shelter for the Damned. I remember you saying that it was, um, Ken Park was one of them, one of the big influences, like in what way that film specifically? Um, I think I, I like the way Larry Clark. Uh, depicts the suburbs not as this kind of um, beautiful facade that needs to be broken through to access the horror. I think for him, the horror is always already there if you just take a look. Um, and I also think the uh, the kind of variations on alienation and anger um, and disillusionment that all the different characters experience in Ken Park and also the relationships between the teenage characters and their parents so yeah, like Ken Park and Bully out of all of Larry Clark's films probably had the biggest influence on this this book. His photography too, um, just Larry Clark in general is a massive um, reference point for me. I love his work, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's, he's like constantly astute at finding different subcultures you'd never thought of before or heard of. Um, and just like, yeah, nailing their vibe, their aesthetic, their... Um, their attitudes and everything yeah for sure um yeah we spoke about that before um what else was gonna say so like i think i've been thinking recently which is really like kind of stupid i guess is i remember it being like a, a either like a cliche or like the most um i don't know what you would call it snot nose thing you could say as a teenager is like i didn't ask to be born i don't know if you've ever heard that expression before but it's like what oh, the yeah. hell is you What's your counter argument to that? Like, <laughs> how did they ever stop? Like, how did they ever stop? How did they ever shut people down from saying that? You know, what, yeah. what's your counter argument to that? <laughs> you brought me into existence and it sucks. Why did you do it? <laughs> like, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And although that, that has like this tenor of, you know, uh, juvenile angst. Yeah. 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 Or whatever. But I mean, that's also, you know, a question that's central to a lot of pessimistic philosophy. So when teenagers are, are posing that question, I think it's a genuine existential crisis of some sort. I remember thinking those kinds of things mm -hmm. or just um, for some reason, I had several years as a teenager where I couldn't stop fixating on the idea of mortality. Like it became really, um, uh, visible to me in a way that I found extremely disturbing. And that's, I think I first started seeing a therapist around that, the time that that question just really wore me down. The question of mortality, what does that mean? Um, 
and 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 yeah, really, that awareness came about during my teenage years, and no one has <laughs> a clear answer for how to deal with that. Um, I remember a therapist talked to me about um, a profound experience he had when one of his beloved birds died or something, and it just somehow didn't resolve anything it for me. Work. But <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's wild. Um, I think what I learned about like depression is that it's totally, it, it's difficult to, I mean, I, I'll just say this to you and I might even cut it because I don't have to say it in a way that isn't like, might be hurtful, but like, it's totally logical. Like there are reasons for it. There are totally good reasons for it. Nobody has a solid counter argument. All, all you can hope for is that you have like the mental health structure, whatever that you don't think about horrible things all the time. But why you don't do that, you don't know. Why somebody does fixate on them, you don't know either, but you can't talk them out of it. Um, or it's very difficult to. Yeah. yeah, yeah, there's like, there's a real necessary utility in being able to um, exist in the present, I guess, which is one of the most common strategies for combating depression, in addition to, you know, sleep, diet, exercise, medication, whatever. Um, but I found for me, one of the, the most useful strategies for managing depression is also meditation, just kind of training my brain to um, be, be acquainted with itself in a strange way, to just like to see the thoughts there and recognize that they can't actually hurt you in some sense. But yeah, I don't know. There is no, I don't think there is any catch all answer and you're right there is in a sense something logical like the world is a scary place the world is full of scary people and um lots of things to be very distressed about especially in our contemporary reality i think mm. there's a reason that there's an influx of people struggling with anxiety and depression and i don't think it's just because we now have the language to talk about these things i also think it comes from like the state of ecological catastrophe the pandemic um you know increasing problems with inequality it's a scary world <laughs> it's a, you know it is yeah there's a lot to be afraid of and i think that um i think one thing that is cathartic for me is seeing stuff like that acknowledged and written about like in stories and just going okay i'm not the only one i think that's definitely what i go to writing for and what kind of keeps me going particularly um i don't know if you know lionel shriver i think i've mentioned her before she did um we need to talk about kevin was her most famous one Mm -hmm. um, and that's very much kind of the themes that I think are partly in Shelter for the Damned and also just the, that we like talking about is that like they give birth to this horrible demon child who does a school shooting and she was like, how did I know? <laughs> how did I know that wasn't going to happen? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Nobody ever did, you know? It's a yeah. gamble every time and, and nobody wants to talk about that. Um, it, it was very good for me. Um, I obviously, like, I lost my dad at the end of twenty. 18 and then i was going to work and there was only one guy i trusted enough to talk about it but he himself had was was about to take like what they call papa permission where they go off and they look after their it's like father what you call it parental leave or something i don't know dads get to do it here um and he was like yeah bringing a child into the world is like a super reckless thing to do and when i look at my child i was like she's gonna have to grow up and watch me die one day <laughs> and i was mm -hmm. like thanks for telling me that i think you're the only dad who's ever mention that out loud because of course i think your job as a father is to never acknowledge stuff like that around your kids to mm -hmm. to um to protect them from the world and i think that what you're kind of writing about is how that's not a watertight thing you can't create someone and, and protect them from the world 100 percent of the time and especially not like when the world can get to them earlier than you intended it to as well yeah Definitely. Yeah. And I think I'm also interested in, like, I, 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 tr I try to depict the environment of my characters as honestly as I can, but uh, it was my hope and intention not to be prescriptive or messagey. I wanted to also acknowledge the, what is to some extent an inexplicable dimension to violence and to rage and to alienation. Um, there are a lot of things you can point to but that's part of what interests me in fiction as well. Why do some people fall into that category of being damned in some sense? Like this character, Mark, 
just cannot seem to, he doesn't even know why he does what he does. He just feels alone and lost and like he wants to disappear. And that creates a lot of anger within him. Mm. Um, so yeah, I can, I can observe the environment. I can look at um, some of the authority figures, his friends, um, the, the systems that he's operating within, like the school system and so on. But ultimately, I'm not really pointing any fingers explicitly. I'm just trying to observe where does mm. this kid come from? And that, I think that's that was my interest in the novel initially, was this character Mark exploring him. Yeah, um, I just read, I don't know if you read Garth Greenwell. He's quite popular at the moment. Um, it's like an American, he's a guy from Kentucky. He lived in Bulgaria. He's got a book called Cleanness Out. And he was like a, an English teacher in Sofia, in Bulgaria. And he talks about how somebody came to him and talked about their like their first loss like it was somebody that they were in love with who rejected them and he talks about how much it hurts and he tries to say listen like one day you'll look back on this and it'll be like it happened to someone else like it was a dream and you won't, you won't remember it and this kid is saying um i don't i don't want it to feel like that i want it to mean something um that's the weird thing about teenage years or about this process maybe of um obsessing over death which i also did in like in my 20s uh, you got there early um but <laughs> uh it just ends. Sometimes it just ends. And you can be thankful it just ends, but it's also kind of disturbing that you don't know why it does as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, and I think I wanted also to adhere to um, the pessimism and fear that I felt a lot as a teenager in, mm. in, in Shelter for the Damned, because um, I don't know, there were periods where I felt like I am going nowhere. I don't fit into this system of things that I see. Um, so I tried to incorporate some of that and draw on that in my characterization because um, I think that's true of a lot of the teenage experience. And I think a lot of people forget that because it's so easy to look back at adolescence and our teenage years and idealize them because things actually do get a lot more complicated and a lot harder. But I don't know, if you, if you go back and really reflect on those years, there's some palpable dread at times oh yeah um, yeah real feeling of doom remember like um long glasgow winters with just like black skies and thinking fuck is this like is this is it gonna end soon like <laughs> <laughs> is this am i witnessing the end and then it's like nope gotta go back to school but i remember it's like it's so weird because it's like you're not enjoying life and you're preparing for an adulthood that you're told is going to be worse <laughs> like <laughs> why yeah. why so best case scenario i have to do all this bullshit i hate to avoid bullshit i would hate more like yeah this mm -hmm. is a, a difficult time do you think your book is for teens um i characterize it as a book with adolescent protagonists for adults but i mean i think it probably depends on the teen i think i probably would have wanted to read it as a teen. I was seeking out quote unquote adult fiction when I was a teenager. Um, so I, m my suspicion is that teens would enjoy it, but I didn't write it uh, within the context of quote unquote YA or young adult fiction or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so I wrote it from an adult perspective, but I, I, I hope and think teenagers would get something out of it. Although it's very much about um, the early 2000s. So we were talking earlier about Ken Park. I think part of the reason I glom onto those Larry Clark films is Ken Park was 2002, this book set in 2003. So it's also like um, an era I remember. I don't know if teens reading it now would, um, I don't know if they would uh, fully, I don't wanna say understand, but if they would relate to a world without social media which I think is a very different world. Like these kids don't have smartphones or social media profiles or anything like that. And I think that is radically different in some senses. Mm. Um, what are the biggest ways it's influenced your life, that influx of connection? Yeah. I mean, as a, as a creative person, as a writer, I found it incredibly valuable in terms of connecting to people in the community, such as yourself and lots of other amazing people. Um, so social media is great for that, 
but I think it has also um, had a lot of negative impacts uh, on my mental health. And I think there's, you know, there's swaths of data to show the, the, the ways in which social media is probably not great for us. It kind of developed quicker than we could understand the effects it would have both individually and socially. Um, so I'm like very wary of social media, but I also rely on it heavily and appreciate what it can do for me as a writer and, and, and in terms of helping, you know, boost other writers to the best of my ability to, um, mm -hmm. is that important to you? Boosting other writers. Yeah. yeah, definitely. I think like for me, that's, that's one positive thing you can use social media for is, is trying your best to help out other people who are on the same path, you know, um, that's one thing I do like it for, but mm -hmm. most other things I'm, I'm very wary of. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I check it like I tried to check it only once a day and I filled like my Instagram and Twitter and everything with just like wholesome memes mostly. It's mostly that. And then just a few writers that I like. I think that's all that's on there. <laughs> <laughs> um and I get very wary of anyone ever saying like, Oh yeah, like the community we're in, Leo. And I'm like, which community am I in? Who's in that? What are the rules to that? I don't want to know. Like <laughs> take <laughs> take me off the list. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> so do you not feel like you're part of the what I don't know whatever you want to call it like the horror or dark fiction community to some extent I feel like I draw from it I feel like out of that I pick people that I want to talk to um mm -hmm. and then interact with them in my own way but it's not like um I'm one of those people who would like never want to be part of a club that would have you as a member is that what they call it mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah just um I don't know why just one of those willful loners or something but i mean writers are like that aren't they for reasons they can't explain it's a very writerly thing um but i i've seen like other people love the community like writers i love i watch them at awards ceremonies and they've got all their friends there and i'm like oh that looks lovely i wish i could have that but somehow it just doesn't seem like um doesn't seem like me i don't know why i don't know why hmm. um, i'm so wary of it i don't know who these people are and and i never Unless I can talk to them on a podcast or something, I just don't. I don't have a strong sense of them, so I don't. I'm I'm wary of. Um, I don't know, just wary of it. Mm -hmm. I don't know what to say. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I mean, it is. Yeah, it, it can be lovely. I get that. Um, do, but does social media somehow feed into your horror as well? I would say more recently. So I have a a book coming out in. Uh, the fall called Peel Back and See. It's a new short story collection and it's coming out through Journal Stone. Um, that book is much more contemporary in its interests. So there's a story um, in there that's basically a Twitter themed horror story. There's a story about a haunted torrent file. Um, the One of the stories is about this really disturbing live feed that someone becomes obsessed with um, that there are all these subreddits devoted to and YouTube channels and things like that. So I, I feel like Darkest Hours was leaning in some ways toward, uh, I don't want to say nostalgia because I, because I think that's a really laden word, but kind of drawing on a genre legacy, whereas Peel Back and See, I feel like is more explicitly situated in the now for the most part. So mm -hmm. yes, more of my recent writing for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah cool. Um... Yeah, nice. I do think you would love Dennis Cooper, particularly. Um, I would start with the Sluts as like his best book, and it's like um, it's like uh, comments left on an escort service or something, but they're all talking about this one person. Um, but you never figure out if it's a real person. If is it the same person? Is it a real person? Are they just living like all their fantasies out through this message board? And then like the characters pile on, and the narrative that they they start creating characters within characters and stuff. I've never seen anything like it. Like what I love about it was like, um, it's so dense in it's like meta textual thing that it does, but it's also so incredibly violent and disgusting that it can only be read by a small amount of people. You know, the Dennis Cooper obviously doesn't give a shit. It's fascinating <laughs> because like, if I was that good a writer, I would want everyone to know about it, you know, because it's like most people won't get through 20 pages of it. I'm sure. Um, so I don't that know. That sounds like something I would dig for sure. Yeah, he's been I on my see, yeah. radar for a while. I just I need to 
pick one up yeah. and get to it. Yeah. I've been I've been thinking of sending him my story collection as well, because I've seen that he's reviewed other stuff for like weird punk books and stuff. Mm-hmm. I, I know he's pretty accessible to new writers and likes to meet them and boost them and stuff. So I don't know. I would try and get in touch with them as well. Cool. Once you've read to be like, love the slots, metatextual thing. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> read my books. <laughs> Yeah, my friend, uh, Josiah Morgan, uh, his first poetry collection, Inside the Castle, came out through Amphetamine Sulfate, which is, I believe Dennis Cooper is affiliated with them. Oh, I might be mistaken, but maybe, yeah. I know Josiah knows him in some capacity. Cool. Yeah. And he makes films as well, no, Dennis Cooper. Have you seen those? No, I haven't. That's cool. Yeah, so has got one called um, Permanent Green Light came out. Uh, and and so it's him and the guy called Zach Farley, I think, who you can, uh, who is added on Facebook by a bunch of people that I know, and it's all like uh, just doomed teenagers is is Dennis Cooper's thing, and so everything oh, he does is about oh, this. Yeah. Very cool. Cool. Nor- a north in northern France, a young man is obsessed with the idea of making himself explode in public. He's not suicidal. He just doesn't. <laughs> he's just not driven to live. <laughs> wow. Great. That sounds really interesting. I'm all about whatever that is, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. Me too. <laughs> um, I'm just thinking because I, I like I read some Dennis Cooper books that were about like I know Columbine was a huge thing for him, and then also we both like Gus Van Sant's Elephant, which is a, more or less about that. Um, that was obviously like a big turning point in terms of people thinking about teenage attitudes. I suppose were there turning points like that in Canada? Were there big cases where everyone? Oh, man. I mean, Columbine definitely made national uh, ripples, I think. And it's strange to think now when it feels like every month there's a school shooting in the U.S., yeah, by, yeah. By, which is so strange because when Columbine happened, it seemed so unprecedented and it was uh, so shocking. Uh, I remember hearing about a house party in Calgary where I live that went really badly and this guy killed several people at the party um i can't remember like how he went about it but he had like all these really somber social media posts before it happened i think it it was an issue of extreme mental illness but Mm -hmm. that was recent i want to say within the last five or six years i was really disturbed by that Mm -hmm. um i'm sure there are others too that i'm forgetting but that was a recent case that kind of uh got under my skin yeah. yeah yeah um what what do you think is happening like you're talking about increase of in depression and anxiety what's like what's at the heart of it right because is it is it when you see all of this connected when you see that everyone is like for me it's like everyone is more or less the same you know like for example i just um i just finished this book shoggy bane by douglas stewart just won the booker prize it's about yeah. uh, um, growing up poor in Glasgow. And I was like, oh, wow. It just felt like it so nailed this time and place that was like stuck in 1980 Glasgow. And suddenly I see the guys on Twitter and he's tweeting like, he tweeted in the last 10 minutes. And suddenly like, I'm, I've just been in his childhood and now he's right there. He's so approachable, but also he's like a Booker Prize winner. And you, you don't ever think of those as people that you could talk to. Mm-hmm. There's such a strange compression of time and space going on that's... Um, Maybe there's something inherently disappointing about it. I don't know. That's interesting. I mean, I think that's really cool. Like that's that's a that's another positive thing about social media is that kind of, um, I guess, uh, subversion of the hierarchy to some extent, or whatever you want to call, it. or maybe it's an illusion of of that. But um, yeah, in terms of mental health crises, I think I think a big part of it is like just more and more consciousness about the environmental crisis. I don't think that can be overstated. Just this real sense that things might be ending, you know? Um, Mm -hmm. I think that causes a lot of despair, Um, especially, I think, in Generation Z, who feels like they were completely born into this situation that's out of control. Um, growing, Growing issues of wealth disparity, I also think the fact that we do have access to language to describe these mental health problems uh, contributes to it might not be as big of an influx as we think. It, part of it might just be more people who were already struggling with these issues now have the access to the words to describe what they've, they've been going through. Mm-hmm. Um, 
and I really do think social media plays a big part too. I mean, there's there's a lot of scholarship and research um, showing that you know these these uh, algorithmic designs um, and these uh, the way these platforms are designed saps us of our serotonin, uh, hinders our uh, ability to focus. I mean, a lot of the side effects of, of uh, heavy social media use look a lot like mental health issues, you know? So it's yeah. kind of, to me, I think those are a lot of, and, and also social media increases the visibility of um, so many of these crises, like how often we're exposed to them. So issues of racism and all kinds of other awful systemic prejudices, and then the issues of comparing ourselves to each other. I think there's probably a lot that that hint that uh, is built into social media in this pro crisis too. Just my point yeah. of view. Yeah, for sure. For me, it was like um, I, another one is like all the murder podcasts. So many murder podcasts, right? Sure. Yeah. And then like so many cases you've never heard of, and I'm like, oh my god, this is like. The way I try to explain it to other people is like if you had a book and it listed like every winner of the lottery there's ever been and you just read like hundreds upon thousands, I don't know how many it ever is, you would start to think that that could happen to you. Even though like it's still ridiculously unlikely, even if you fill a book through it, it's just you see like happen to them, 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 and they're all ordinary people. You start to think that whatever you're reading about is like right outside your door somehow, you know? Mm -hmm. So... I don't know, all of this wealth of content, um, these con this constant influx of new stories every day makes you feel like a new horrible story is about to happen to you somehow, you know? Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah, I think there, that has a, a definitely pointed psychological effect, just reading, you know, whenever there's a crisis, whether it be, you know, yet another um, murder of a Black or indigenous person by a police officer, and then just the influx of response on social media and all the discourse and engagement and, and this infighting, sometimes it looks very cannibalistic too among certain groups. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it becomes distressing in a, in a way that I don't know it would have been before the arrival of, of that kind of media. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. Is it like... Do you think it's like a kind of dip before suddenly we create some sort of utopia out of all these problems getting fixed? <laughs> I don't know. I think I'm a I'm a little bit pessimistic. I'm I'm a I'm a pessimist optimist maybe or an optimistic pessimist. I so I, I grapple with both. I, I realize like I can't completely um, subordinate myself to my pessimism, which to me seems like the most realistic way of viewing the world, but I can't move through the world as a full-fledged pessimist. Mm -hmm. So I also hang on to some degree of optimism almost in spite of myself. So I like to believe that's possible, I guess I should say. <laughs> Fair, absolutely. Yeah, I think we yeah. all need to live with a bit of hope, right? Um, I th like for me, uh, I was doing some meditations that were talking about free will and and how, like you say, when the thoughts come up, um, they're not somehow they're not yours. You know, you don't know where they're coming from and so on. And and that's where you say they can't hurt you, and also you can take a bit less ownership of them, even though they're in your own head. So then I started going through the world, thinking like, oh, I'm just I'm a little less in control of my thoughts, feelings, actions, and that was nice. It was nice just to take a little bit of responsibility off. But I'm not going to go all the way and just be like. I'm nothing but a meat puppet, like, dragging his way towards the grave. <laughs> I won't go that far. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe in your fiction, right? You can go to those places. That's a great title, Meat Puppet Dragging Himself Towards the Grave. That's my next collection. I'm right yeah. yeah, yeah, I can see that as a, as a like, 1960s horror movie poster somehow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, no, that's so true. Actually, in one of the stories in Peel Back and See, I draw on some of the language used in therapy and a, a popular acronym is BET, which is behavior, emotions, thoughts. So when you look at this triangle of reaction, um, the therapist will always ask, which of these three things is easiest to change? And of course the answer is behavior. You can't, you can't change your emotions. You can't change your thoughts. They just kind of arrive often mm -hmm. thoughts. So, so usually it begins with a thought and the thought will then incite an emotional response. And then you can choose how to behave in accordance to that. 
that's really all you have control over. You can look at your thoughts, you can try and identify them and, and, and categorize them, but to try and push them down or get rid of them, I think is a fool's errand. Um, just my point of view. Yeah. And how about um, advice for people who are like ruminating on death loads? What should they do? I think um, for me, for me, therapy has been huge. I think it's important for me to have someone who takes a psychodynamic approach as opposed to CBT. I think CBT has its value, but it's it's limited mostly to techniques. So for me, once I learned some of the techniques of CBT, which have value, um, I, I find it much more useful to engage in psychodynamic approaches. So having a confrontation with myself, where where is the origin of these problems? Um, and I, like I said, I found meditation is huge. Um, it's it's kind of a, a cruel irony that sleep, diet, and exercise are so important when those are three things that suffer as a result of depression, but they do matter. Um, mm. And I've found for me, medication helps. It probably depends on the person, but that has been useful for me. So I would, I probably would just talk to anybody dealing with these issues and get a sense of what they think would help them, tell them what's helped me, but there's no guarantee my approach will work for somebody else, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Writing is so crucial, I think. Um, like, I feel like uh, most of my writing is some form of exorcism. You get it out and there is something, yeah, I mean, the word is overused, but there really is a catharsis in that, in materializing whatever it is, the anxiety, the depression, uh, the trauma, you know, in, in some fictional context, especially for me, I feel like horror gives me the liberty to, uh, to give this kind of excessive body to uh, those feelings. That's really liberating, maybe is the mm. word. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe that's why I do think that's why there's like an overriding kindness in the horror community is because it's filled with people who are already like, already scared, I think, um, and they're comforted by horror. Um, and so they're nice to each other <laughs> as a result. Yeah, I think we're a big bunch of wussies deep down horror writers. We're the most scared, uh, gentle people. I That's been my perception anyway. Just absolutely the softest people are in the Across horror the world. Boards. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a funny yeah, for thing. Sure. But yeah, I, I think for me, just like talking about this stuff, because a lot of, um, you don't notice how much... Um, there's like a weird shame associated with these ruminations. Um, somehow you feel like you brought them upon yourself and you deserve them and they're only yours and none of that is true. You know, you're not the only one thinking anything and it's not your fault for thinking it. Um, like I said, there's plenty of valid reasons to be really sad sometimes, you know? Um, yes. Yeah, and in terms of that destigmatizing, I guess another thing I would always recommend is, you know, reach out to somebody. If you're having a, a crisis, a mental health crisis of some kind, you know, you should, I know it can be hard to do, especially as an introverted person, but that's another thing that I think is so important. The more people feel comfortable, you know, leaning on, you know, whatever it is, friends, family, partners, professional resources, the less quote unquote weird it seems. Yeah. And I think it will, it will become easier to disprove all the things you're telling yourself. It's like, look, these people genuinely do care and they're trying to help. So I don't think you can keep telling yourself that they don't care, you know? Um, yeah. Hopefully. Um, yes. Tell me about, have you been watching anything good lately? Uh, what have I watched recently? I watched a late 70s Italian horror movie called Screamers the other day. I discovered okay. I have a VHS of it. I don't know where I got it. Um, that was a lot of fun. Uh, do you have a VHS I player? I do, yes, yeah. It's a prized possession. That's important uh, to you? Yeah, yeah, format, I know. Yeah. I, <laughs> I know it's an inferior format, but there's something very nostalgic and comforting about that analog buzz. It's similar to like the sonic texture of vinyl or something. Um, so yeah, I, I acknowledge it's inferior, but every now and then it's so cozy to as put on As long as I got that on tape that it's worse. You know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I don't mind. I don't mind. Um, yeah. yeah, I can't remember what else I've 
have have you seen anything cool recently? Uh, so started rewatching. I never had watched that much of the X Files before. Mm -hmm. you, did did you were a big year watcher of that? Or? That's a massive blind spot. I need to get to because I, I love that era of uh, genre television, but I haven't got to it yet. Yeah, it's so great, and they've like HD remastered it and everything, so it looks fantastic. Because I remember I could never see it when it was on the TV because everything was so dark all the time. <laughs> like crank up the brightness and i was like what is there an alien in the corner or something so <laughs> i'm really i'm really glad i think i was like there, there's i've always been a little old man inside somehow because like i watch it now with the brightness cranked up and like the volume is down and i've got the subtitles on and i'm like okay they're not, <laughs> not gonna be too scary that's good <laughs> oh i just remembered i also watched um the jamie blanks films i hadn't seen he's an amazing guy. I just connected with him on Twitter recently. He directed the late 90s horror movie Urban Legend and he did Valentine, which came out in the early 2000s. So he had these yeah. two Australian films, Storm Warning and Long Weekend, and his work's great. Like he composed the scores for those two films, he edited them, um, and he apparently directed Storm Warning in a very short amount of time. But that's a cool kind of 70s throwback. Aussie film from the mid 2000s. I really dug that. That was really cool. cool. Yeah. It's really special when directors can do all of that stuff by themselves. I mean, I do, I like, I love an author. Yeah. And um, yeah, I think that's how you get it is by taking over so many of the, those roles yourself where possible. That really helps. Definitely. Yeah. I guess, I mean, John Carpenter is kind of uh, one of the leading figures in horror for that. I mean, the, the texture of his films is so it's so incumbent on him what he brings to it his score his writing his directing it's just like all over the film that's what your thesis was all about right yeah i wrote my thesis on a film called prince of darkness have you seen that one no no i haven't i started it's... reading your thesis because you were kind enough to send it to me um, oh cool yeah my apologies no no it condolences <laughs> <laughs> It was awesome. It's cool. I don't know anything about. Um, I think what I learned as a writer is that like writing and um, I don't know literary theory are two totally different um, disciplines. You can be an amazing writer and know nothing about literary theory. I mean, look at me. I am. <laughs> so, yeah. I think the true is the uh, is very true of the reverse too. There are a lot of you know literary scholars who probably couldn't write fiction to save their lives. So yeah, 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 for sure. Yes, that's cool. I'll check those out. Prince of Darkness, Storm Warning. What have I seen of John Carpenter recently? I watched, what's his first one called? Dark uh, Star? Yeah. I watched that <laughs> one recently. Fun. That was cool. Yeah, it is interesting. The big alien balloon thing that he made made it in his garage. This like epic <laughs> yeah, that's a donor cool comedy in space or something. Wild. <laughs> yeah. God, I love yeah, that I ambition. And I love, I, I very much love um, when people make cinema like a DIY and down to earth and remove all kind of pretensions from it and make it just a bit fun experimentation and that's where all the innovation comes from that's where all the cool tricks that we know of you know there were just people messing about so i love when cinema is that yeah yeah me too so you're not watching a lot of series or tv not really i just for the first time saw all of the sopranos within the year so that was pretty staggering just as a like massive piece of writing and performance and is it worth um, watching still oh yeah it's i mean i i feel like i i kind of had this um misinformed biased assumption about it that it would just be a scorsese ripoff i was yeah. like oh, i've seen it before do i want to see a bunch of seasons ripping up it's it's not that at all it's 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 like this really enormous character piece um and the characters are so beautifully fleshed out and it's also kind of self-aware it has an element of postmodernism almost involved like um the way it invokes gangster tropes and subverts them like the a, a significant portion of the show is dedicated to the way the lead character undergoes his process of therapy so it's like this like high up mob guy uh, you know, attending therapy sessions and understanding where his his anger comes from and how he ended up in that world. It's, uh, yeah, it's phenomenal stuff. Loved The Sopranos. Cool. Have you yeah. seen The Wire? I haven't. I've heard amazing things, though. 
Yeah, good. I don't know if that's any good. I think it takes a long time to get into because it's right. filled with like this Baltimore slang. Every episode I've watched, I've just been like, what the hell are they talking about? <laughs> you have yeah. to learn a whole vocabulary with it, I think. Um, I've also heard Six Feet Under is very good, but I've never watched that before. I'm a terrible TV viewer. I just like, I'm. it's so hard for me to commit to like multiple seasons of something. I'm like, that's a mm-hmm. big fucking chunk of my life. Um, yeah. so I feel like I'm still catching up on old TV show. I, I like the original Star Trek a lot from the sixties. I like Buffy the Vampire Slayer, the Twilight I started Zone. watching that, yeah. Isn't that good? It's so it's still good, yeah. It's great. Yeah, fantastic show. Mm-hmm. Um you know what I was gonna say? What what I find myself doing recently is like I start a film at night, I watch half an hour of it, then I go to sleep, and then in the morning I don't want to see it anymore. <laughs> so I just start another <laughs> film. I've got like 10 tabs open with different films i watched the first half hour of and i'm like nah, i'm not in the mood for any of these anymore so <laughs> i recommend it it gets me through every evening but i don't know it doesn't I bother think... you like you're not like how does this end no I, th- I think now what i'm doing is like watching stuff with a director's eye i think so i'm happy just to like I think if you watch the first half hour of something, you you gather most of the time most of the techniques that they're using, like mm. the style of the acting, the editing, camera work, lighting, and so on. So it's it's always a useful exercise for me. It's never a waste. And because you act and write and direct as well, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Write, act, direct, uh, edited, and did all the coloring and everything. Um, yeah, just because the thing is, like, if you if you're if you've found a way to make like a no budget feature by yourself what you've created the most valuable thing you've created is opportunity so Mm -hmm. why would you not even if you're not the best writer actor editor director whatever when are you ever going to get a chance to edit a feature film who's ever going to offer that to you you know just Mm -hmm. do it yourself that's my theory um and through doing it the only way i know how to get better at anything is by doing it i can't i can't be taught anything so um (laughs) I have to just do it by myself. Yeah, that's cool, man. Well, I think that, I, and I, I hope that that leads to more original choices because many times I've heard advice from people who've gone to film school, and I'm like, I'm glad I didn't know that because then I wouldn't have done that, and I don't agree with it. You know, it's like don't use a gimbal because you can't repeat camera movements. I'm like, mm. who cares about that? Like, I'm so glad I didn't know that. I use a gimbal all the time; it's great. Um, and other stuff, I don't know. People are just like, uh, but Leo, have you thought of a way of how to introduce your character? And I was like, mm, from the left, I think. <laughs> <laughs> just that's cool. I don't know. Just when you, I, I think that when you um, go about things as if you're the first person to have ever done it, hopefully, then you become free enough to invent new ways to do it. Um, and I think that if you're going to write something, you have to be open to the idea that you're going to do it in a new way. Or else, what the hell are you doing? You know, I know it seems weird that you might come up with an original way to do it, but everyone, like everyone throughout history, has. So, you know, I don't know another way to do it personally. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think the only way I could have learned how to write was by writing a lot of bad stuff, and then eventually you write okay stuff, and then maybe eventually you write good stuff. That's the goal that you you write good stuff. Um, but yeah, like there's no other way than to just do it. Yeah. And nicely along the way, you're so bad at evaluating your own work that you think it's better than it is. And I think you have to, that's a safety mechanism in the brain is that you're terrible for years and you don't know it, you know? Yeah. 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 The imposter syndrome, I think comes in once you start maybe figuring out what you're doing. Maybe that's a sign. Once you start thinking that you suck, maybe it's a sign that you're starting to get okay or maybe even good. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, yeah recently i've been like I'm, I'm getting really lucky these days and it's like <laughs> dude you've been doing you've been doing this for 10 years you might know something about it and i'm like oh mm, gotta stay humble gotta oof, take that thought away <laughs> um and read a lot right that 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 is so true oh, yeah. i think yeah yeah, yeah yeah especially as a filmmaker i would say my god i think the one thing they're doing the least is reading you know because they're focusing so much on camera techniques and stuff but as, as far as i'm concerned it's story that comes first and you're only going to get the most original story by you're reading the most stuff that's out there everyone should be reading all the time um i think yeah. yeah for sure um cool so tell me 
do you know dates on when things are coming out? Shelter for the Damned is out already. Yes, Shelter for yes. the Damned is out already. Uh, came out on February 26th, so that's available everywhere. Yep. Um, the Darkest Hours reissue comes out in June. And uh, Peel Back and See drops in October, I believe. So it's a busy year. That's <laughs> yeah. a big year for you. I know. it's uh, Yeah, it's great. And then I have um, an essay in a University of Texas Press Toby Hooper anthology that comes out in June. And uh, there's an anthology coming out through Seventh Terrace, I think in June or July. And I have a story in a Lucio Fulci tribute anthology coming out soon too. It's it's 2021. I guess it's just the thing to do is to just sit inside as a pandemic rages in the world and then stuff will happen, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Awesome. So be on the lookout for Mike's three books this year. Can't believe it. I'm going to buy all of them in paperback and get him to sign them or something. I don't know. I'm very excited. I think they all sound great. Well, I've already read two of them, so I know that they're great. <laughs> but this new collection of short stories sounds cool as well. So, yeah. Oh, and Darkest Hours comes with new material, essays and stuff, I believe. So that's very cool. I'll be getting a copy of that again. And I suggest you do too. There'll be links in the description so you can find out all about that. If you would like to be on the show as well, uh, if you want to tell me something about it, you can always do so using losingtheplotpodcast.gmail.com and I look forward to hearing from you. But that's all from me for this episode, so until next time.